Description is the title. One quick tip versus every single boss fight in Elden Ring. If there's a duo fight I didn't include, it's because I already gave a tip for both bosses individually and I didn't think their movesets varied enough to warrant adjusting to a whole new strategy. I'm also focusing on specific counters to each boss and what they're weak to, so I'm sorry, but tips like chug this flask or use magic just won't be appearing on here. Facing two of them at once can seem daunting, but they can be worn down quickly. Wait until they try to grab you and then dodge into the grab to avoid it, allowing you to wail on the open cavity for a good three or four hits. Stay close to him and you can bait him into doing melee attacks with his shitty flail. The less pyromancy spam he dishes out, the better. Go up behind him and backstab him when he's casting Flame of the Fell God, and if you time it right, the explosion won't even damage you. I don't know why everyone is saying Meteorite is easy to exploit with melee, because that shit tracks you no matter where you stand. All of the Alabaster Lord's attacks have extremely long recoveries, so much so that he just stands there half the time doing nothing. Jump attack him with a large weapon like a great axe and you'll stagger him in no time. Electo can be really hard to follow, so don't be ashamed of using Glint Blade spells to help wear down her posture, and then move in for a critical. You can also run up to her and time melee strikes with the glint blades to practically guarantee big damage. Strong to magic, weak to fire. Its easiest attack to punish is its dive attack where it hops twice in the air and then pounces down. I'm being as serious as possible when I say that its attacks are designed to look cool over actually doing damage. Easily telegraphed and any moderately upgraded weapon can take him down. Lancier's glaive takes an extremely long time to wind up, but it does cover a large area in front of her, so use Torrent to zip up to her when you see the telegraph and get in some melee strikes. Wear her down with sorceries and ranged attacks until she eventually just flies away. When you fight her in Rampart side, a lot of her melee attacks leave her head low to the ground during the recovery. He's weak to pretty much any element aside from Holy, so if you have any fire or lightning attacks, now's the time to use them. His frostbite breath attack leaves him in recovery for a good couple seconds, which is a perfect time to get in some melee damage. Start out the fight with Exyke's Decay to inflict Scarlet Rot for some huge damage over time. When you see him spiral into the air, dodging forward puts you right under him as he comes down, allowing you to get off a couple melees with relative safety. Astel usually teleports away from you when you close distance, so if you're already far away and he teleports, that means he's approaching you from either the left or behind to grab you. This is an insta-death attack and you better not get hit by it. A shield with high magic resistance comes in really handy here, otherwise you can put him to sleep, backstab him, parry him, break his posture, anything you want really. Oh, and Gavel of Hema is super easy to dodge roll through and super punishable via melee attacks. This guy's really strong against lightning, but very weak against fire. He'll let you know his huge combo is coming by roaring and then going apeshit with his giant pizza cutter. This combo has exactly 6 hits and you have plenty of time to close distance and wail on him after it's done. Extremely high holy damage resistance. A lot of his melee attacks aren't easy to respond to because of how quick they are, but you can keep him mid-range and keep an eye out for when he starts casting Beast Claw. Run around him to get in damage since the incantation only fans out in front of him. His wide sweeping claw can also be easily responded to with jump attacks. If you're trying to subdue him in the Sanctum, you can aggro the Black Blade Kindred outside and get him to spam wax cutters at the door. His ranged attacks are complete bullshit for melee builds, but if you stick close to him, you can bait him into using his shield bash attack much more frequently, which just so happens to be one of the easiest of his attacks to punish, so go crazy. Strong against all status ailments, and the damage output these guys have are just, it, it, it's just insane, it's just stupid. Try not to fight them on a flat surface, because even a somewhat elevated ledge can cause their attacks to be interrupted via gravity allowing you to continue whatever ranged bullying you have available. If they're fighting you while invisible, use Phalanx spells to give away their location really easily and then close in with some melee damage before they go invisible again. You can fight the one in Sage's cave by looking for her footsteps in the water, but you can also use the Sentry's Torch to reveal her position. Glint Blade Phalanx also works here too because it can stagger this boss really easily, but if you aren't running a magic build, you can also deflect his attacks with a Great Shield, stopping his combo and leaving him open for punishment. Balls! The Carrion Knight is basically just a souped up troll with a magic sword. The only attack you need to watch out for are the glint blades. Sometimes his melee strikes line up with the glint blades in a way that's really uncomfortable to dodge, so get some distance from him so you can dodge the blades when they launch without having to worry about anything else. Pretty weak to hammers and strike weapons, immune to frostbite, obviously, but surprisingly weak to scarlet rod and bleed. He'll try to disengage by leaping backwards with a frost attack, but if you act fast and stay around his legs, you can avoid the attack altogether while continuing pressure. Use fouling spells to stun them when they teleport up to you and burn them down easily with melee attacks. In case you couldn't tell, we're going to be using this strategy quite a bit for enemies that are incredibly fast or have a habit of leaving your line of sight. When he goes for an impale attack, dodge right and punish it with a backstab. He also uses this attack to close distance, so you can prevent it from happening by simply staying close to him. The spectral knights won't respawn when they die, so kite them around and kill them first. The knights are weak to magic damage, so Kari and Greatsword or Adula's Moonblade can hit both of them for great damage if they rush you at the same time. O'Neill may be resistant to sleep effects, but that doesn't mean he won't stagger when you try to give him a nap. His summons will always be on the same side of the arena, so when he starts 
starts beckoning his minions, beat them there, and start walloping on them. This dude is a brick wall with high defense versus pretty much everything. His attacks are pretty easy to read, but it's next to impossible to stun or stagger him. So bigger weapons with high damage like great axes or great hammers are recommended since you'll only ever have enough time for a single attack in between blows. The Misbegotten Warrior is easily the more nimble of the two, and the Crucible Knight doesn't even spawn until you've whittled the warrior down to half health. Ideally, you want to separate them as much as you can, so use small range attacks to make the warrior chase you, and counter whatever he does with jump attacks. He should go down pretty quickly, allowing you to only focus on the knight. Fighting two of these guys at once is pretty much just a war of attrition. If you're using sorceries, the Azer Staff can help because it speeds up casting time. Once you get one down to half health, it's pretty easy to bait out an aerial slam attack and then follow up with some damage of your own. Repeat until dead. Not unlike the other Crucible Knight fights, but you'll find Siluria in the deep root depths, which means she hits like a Ford F-150, i.e. predictably and infrequently. Not a lot of HP either, so anything you did for the other Crucible Knights can be applied here as well. Counter swords with ranged, counter ranged with swords. The spear variant is easily the most aggressive, so if you're facing more than one, make the spear guy chase you around while you fire sorcery at him, and his super armor should peel off pretty quickly. The death bird is extremely weak to holy damage, so buff your weapon with some holy grease, wait for him to swing his big fireplace poker thing, and smack his hind legs until he's dead. When he goes for a jumping attack, he leaves his head vulnerable for a split second, so try to dodge and counter with your own jump attack. Do not fight this thing on horseback. It will clip you with fire damage and knock your shit off. Same thing works here, it can't really do much if you swipe at its legs, and it goes down pretty quickly against holy damage and strike weapons. If you fought any other dragon before, the moveset should be familiar. Only difference is the infliction of Scarlet Rot. He's pretty immobile and weak to just about everything, making his head a primary target for sorceries, but you might be better off finding a bleed or a frostbite weapon and just going for his legs, since his resistance to both are pretty weak. Weak to literally everything, I'm not kidding. Use jump attacks to stagger one quickly and go in for a critical. In the coastal cave, the boss doesn't trigger right away, so stealth around in the bushes to take care of some of the smaller enemies beforehand. Some queens have a second phase where they enter rage mode and throw their staff and start going ape shit, making it hard to cast spells because they just don't leave you alone. Frostbite can proc extremely fast, so find a cold weapon with lots of frost buildup and take her down. During his second phase, it's actually safer to fight off the horse because his lightning attacks are much easier to dodge. You can also sneak behind the boss from the left and use the poison mist incantation without aggroing him. You find this dragon in Siofra and in the Lake of Rot. It has an arsenal of attacks that are both close and long range, so playing the range game and keeping him remotely close on horseback can bait a melee with a really long recovery time, allowing you to get in close and whack him a bunch until he's dead. He spends a lot of his second phase out of combat range throwing lightning spears at you, but this can easily be countered with sorceries when this happens. Very easily punished with melee when he charges his body with lightning and dives forward. Dodging backwards is actually good advice if he's attacking you with his claws. Sometimes he'll slam downward and then rake his hand to the side, leaving lingering lightning on the floor. He has extremely high resistance to all status ailments, but incantations like Exike's Decay or Borealis Mist can still proc an effect really fast when he's sitting still. Incantations like Pest Threads were great against large and slow targets because they have the chance to hit multiple times. The Elven Beast will open the fight by breathing golden fire, so immediately run up to it and around it and sink in whatever damage you can. Also, you're supposed to jump over the rings, not dodge through them. Burn it! Burn it to the ground! Extremely weak against fire, and extremely vulnerable against ranged attacks after their ass bounce that spreads rot everywhere. Fire Grease helps too if you want to get in close, since all of its attacks have pretty long recoveries, and if it begins a combo with a downward slam, watch for a follow-up swing coming from your left and dodge into it. Esger is joined by two dogs that inflict blood loss, and the last thing we want is for that attack to kill us immediately and reset us. Spawn some glint blades and let them take care of the dogs when they get close, allowing you to focus on jump attacking the living shit out of poor Esger here. Use the ore blade. It's in the description for fuck's sake, just go to Kaled Waypoint Ruins and pick this up, you should be fine. Take advantage of the long recovery window after it casts a large Earth AoE at you. The full-grown variant has a gravity beam attack in its second phase that can be avoided altogether by just not being out in the open. Use Torrent to close distance fast if you need to, and then enjoy your free damage. Weak to every status element under the sun. Watch for their aerial slam attack so you can punish them with a bleed or frostbite weapon. Ashes of War, like Orfrost Stomp, are capable of hitting both targets multiple times, and I know it got nerfed, but it can still be pretty good in some situations or you can just use a duel as Moonblade, either one works. Fia's tier 3 subs are pretty easy to take down one at a time, but the last wave consists of three fights at once. Spawn in some glint blades if multiple targets rush you to stop one of them as they're running. They don't have too much poise either, so a heavy jump attack can break posture pretty easily. Only use Torrent to close distance. You have very limited evasion options on horseback, especially when he enters his second phase and starts shooting even more projectiles. It's easier to just dodge them outright and summon Torrent if you want to reposition, such as catching up to him when he rolls. If you 
you have a magic build, just keep shooting at his head until it dies. If you're a melee build, wait until his head goes down after trying to wing swipe you. Slashing at his legs honestly isn't a bad idea either, but you should keep moving. Don't let the limited fighting space intimidate you into making mistakes. Grail really isn't that special. Use the bleed weapon and attack his legs, and you just you should be fine. Staying on horseback can really help close distance for attacking or making distance when he charges up fire breath. Backstabs and bleed damage. These two strategies remain constant to the bitter end. If it bleeds, it can die. Try to keep him close so he doesn't extend his chain attack and rotate around him with the shield when he attacks for easy backstabs. You can use the iframes of leaping off your horse to juke the glintstone missiles and avoid taking damage from its dive attack. Like most dragons, staying close to them means they'll try to stomp on you and tail swipe you and stuff. At the end of almost every attack, however, they lower their head for a good couple seconds, so have a hard-hitting weapon ready for when it comes down. Basically just a Godric clone without a cool second phase. Highly resistant to holy damage, but that's about it. At the start of his fight at the Elden Throne, he's very susceptible to magic spam that can eat away a good chunk of his health before he starts running to you. Pick yourself up a claw talisman or raptor's black feathers and counter his stomps with jump attacks. Dealing with this guy's windups are agonizing and not worth it, so wait until he starts windmilling his axe around and uses a slam attack so you can do a heavy jump attack of your own. Run around to his ass once you see the first three hits of his five hit combo, and the final hit will miss you completely. Stick close to him when he's shooting fire horizontally across the arena. When he does this at the beginning of his second phase, you can use the entire attack animation just to get free damage. Put him to sleep. The Scion has a four hit combo he uses a lot, but sometimes there will be a follow up. Get in close and block these four hits with a shield, and after that, just walk around him, and the final blow should just miss you completely. Avoid blocking because his attacks do a lot of stamina damage. Instead, stay close and bait him into a three hit combo where the last blow leaves him vulnerable to being backstabbed. You can also dodge his aerial to slam, which leaves him vulnerable to the exact same thing. Just backstab him and he should die. You can chew through his posture pretty quickly if you gnaw at his ankles, but sometimes continuing to attack his weak spots while he's down instead of going for the critical can do much more damage over time, depending on the weapon. His attacks leave him recovering just long enough to be open to a single strike. He doesn't have armor anymore, so he's more susceptible to bleed damage. Don't try to chase him around, just conserve your stamina and let him come to you. You face two of these in Seethwater Cave, and they can be quite annoying with spam attacks. Bum rush one of them as soon as you can to prevent ranged spam from both of them at the same time. The quicker one dies, the easier. If you have a one-shot build in progress, now might be the time to use it. Also very susceptible to guard counters. His attacks do lots of stamina damage, so kite him and wait until his leaping attacks to strike. Whenever he roars like this, he'll usually stomp and then swing his weapon twice. So that's your cue to step back and give him a bit of space. Staying under his legs while he casts Death Lightning is a good way to avoid most of the Death Blight buildup around the arena. Hack away at his legs during the first phase and consider switching to a ranged strat during the second phase as he becomes a lot harder to close in on due to his sweeping glaive attacks and large AoEs. Locking on while fighting this enemy means that almost all of your attacks are going to hit his head if you're in the front. Wait for his slow ass windups to finish and then get behind him and sink in a couple hits. He takes more than long enough. You can you can get away with it. You know that one person in your friend group that tries to say something funny, but everyone ignores him, so he just decides to say it again and louder? That's the magma worm. This motherfucker does the same attack like four times in a row, and thankfully they don't move their heads that much. So any ranged options you have, I'd say pull them out now. Start hitting their hind legs in phase two for posture damage. Run away from the first two, dodge roll into the third. There. Now stop using a shield. She's gonna punish you for it in the second phase. Also weak to frostbite. If you're close enough to her, Adula's Moonblade can still catch her, even if she tries to dodge it. If he spawns three projectiles in the air, he'll always do a wide sweeping two hit attack immediately after. Stay close enough to him and you can avoid the hitbox of most of his standard attacks. You can tell his weird judgment cut attack thing is coming by the glow of his sword, but it's not as likely to hit you if you dodge forward past the hitbox. Fight patches in Murkwater Cave and he'll sell you Margit Shackle if you find his campsite near the scenic isle in Lyurnia. He can also stop you from healing by throwing a knife and leaping towards you with his giant stick thing. So if you need to heal and you're mid-range, always wait until his combo is actually finished before you heal. Walk into the arena and unequip all your shit. Wait until the Mimic Tear begins to run at you and equip everything back again. The boss will literally only fight you by punching you and deal like 2 damage per attack. It's kind of hilarious. If you want a somewhat fair fight, you can keep a really shitty weapon in your inventory so that they only fight you with like a like a plus 1 dagger or something. Burn it! It's really easy to psych yourself out by dodging the weapon skill because he does an overhead swing followed by the actual swing of the sword. Wait for the second swing and then dodge forward to avoid the projectile. He takes a sweet-ass time approaching you from his end of the arena, so spam some ranged attacks to start. Ironically weak to blood damage, so a weapon like the Reduvia or Eleonora's Pole Blade can excel here. If you have the Purifying Crystal tier, you have a huge opportunity to deal damage during his Blood Curse animation to mitigate some of his healing. He's weaker to slash damage than other physical types. Dodge to the right when he charges you with a spear because he follows it up with a sword swipe that will almost always catch you on the left side. Make a habit of rolling forward into his blood slashes, and you can still use Margit Shackle on him twice in the first phase. Garrus does lots of damage with his 
Mantis Flail, but with a heavy enough attack, you should be able to stun him out of combos with relative ease. Do not use a shield to block because Garrus is programmed to hit you with a critical if your guard is broken. The Knight's Cavalry is weak to lightning attack, so use incantations like Lightning Spear or buff your weapon up with some Lightning Grease. They're both weak to holy damage and they get stunned out of attack combos pretty easily, so a moderately heavy weapon like a great sword might just be the thing here. They don't really get in a rush for anything, so it's difficult to bait one of them into attacking you, but if you fire a spell right in between them at the start of the fight, they should dodge in opposite directions. The Omen Killer will always leap at you three times when out of range to close distance. Back up from the first attack and roll right to dodge the next two, and you can take advantage of a pretty decent recovery window. In close range, he'll spit fire at you to try and get you to back off, but it's pretty easy to dodge around and continue pressure. Race behind him and backstab him when he commits to a heavy attack or when you see him charge up a breath attack. Perfumer Trisha is coupled with a misbegotten warrior boss, and the same strategy we employed with the warrior and crucible knight battle in Kaled can also be applied here. The misbegotten is much quicker to force into melee exchanges, so pay attention to his combos and wear him down with jump attacks. Bleed weapons work well against both bosses here. Easily Radagon's most punishable attack is his three hit shockwave combo. You have plenty of time to get in a couple strikes before the second and third attack, and even a couple more after the full attack is finished. When he powers up his hammer and slams down, you can dodge the shockwave by rolling into it. This will flex the combo melee and magic together to make attacks as uncomfortable to dodge as possible. If you run parallel to how the glint blades are lined up, you can just continue running and they'll most likely glide past you, saving your roll for when the wolf lunges at you. The regal spirit's healing is an AoE, meaning it's directly proportional to how many spirits are in its vicinity. Get it to around half health and then lure it into an area that doesn't have as many spirit animals to lessen the healing effect. Melee builds are king in this fight because Renala's physical defenses are absolute trash. At the beginning of her second phase, run straight to her as she's charging her comet attack and roll right to avoid it and sink in a couple hits. Don't attack her spirits either, just play passively when she uses summons and eventually they'll just go away on their own. Whatever you do, don't dodge backwards. She fights on horseback, which means jumping attacks are extra effective at breaking down posture. You can get these in whenever you see her charging up spells. Pay attention to where it teleports when it does, because most times it'll charge up a poison attack immediately after. Dodging is important here because the recovery window isn't much, but it's the best it's probably gonna give you. Go right up to it and cast any heal you have for super high damage. I promise this this works. The rune bears have really large hitboxes to their attacks, but if you make a habit of dodging forwards and to the right, it can save you from taking a lot of damage and put you in the perfect position for a couple attacks during its recovery. If you're tired of that really annoying Rancor call attack in the second phase that has you running in circles, stunning him frequently with a Serpent Hunter's L2 can prevent that attack from happening altogether. The Sanguine Noble can and will parry you if you try to spam melee attacks, so catch him running towards you and cast a Glint Blade Sorcery to mess up his rhythm, then time some melee attacks with when the blades launch for extra damage. Also ironically weak to blood damage, so Reduvia, Rivers, Eleonora's Pole Blade, any of those can work. This dude takes so damn long to wind his shit up you can actually get in a couple light attacks before he even swings his axe. Also extremely low resistance to every status ailment, so go nuts. Use the Eternal Darkness spell to nullify most of his projectile sorceries. If you don't have that spell, you can always fight him around pillars, so there's plenty of map geometry for his spells to get caught on. Karian and Golden Retaliation also work pretty well. Just f just kill him. Just kill him. I got nothing. Just press the attack button and win the fight. Have you fought Witches of Hemwick? Then you fought the Spirit Caller Snail without even knowing it. Its position is discernible by a faint glow of light around its body, making it unable to ever be truly hidden from view. Time your summons in between Radon's arrows and hang back far enough to where he only shoots you with the charged shots, and just wait until your summons advance far up enough to attack him, forcing him into melee combat. This entirely prevents attacks like Arrow Rain and Scatter Arrow. Don't be fooled into thinking you aren't doing damage just because your sword is deflecting off his ankles. Hard-hitting strength weapons are the way to go for this one, but you can also give him a nice nap by inflicting sleep and stabbing him in his face. Extremely weak to strike weapons and holy damage, so if you have a hammer or something, now is the time to use it. Stay close and trick him into killing his own dudes with a tidal wave and then close distance with some jumping attacks. When he charges at you and leaps at you with his halberd, he'll almost always follow up with a thrusting strike, but only if you're directly beside him. Dodge out of the leap attack and then run around to slap his ass instead of stopping at his side, and he'll either miss or the attack just won't happen. Ride past them and activate the grace inside the city wall. Reset their positions by resting at the grace and then approach the left sentinel from behind with the highest damage attack you have. You can try to use poison mist, but they start walking forward once you get within a certain range, so it is a bit tricky. Fuck these guys and their weird hitboxes. Staying close to their tail can even be a winning strategy because any attack involving the front half of its body can just sail right over you. It can still swipe you with its tail though, so keep an eye out for that. Weak to both fire and frostbite, so have a cold affinity weapon with some fire incantations on the side and you should be perfectly fine. The second gargoyle doesn't spawn until you've whittled down the first one's health to less than half. Fight the first gargoyle near the arena entrance so the twin blade gargoyle takes more time to actually run up to you when it spawns in. Also weak to strike damage, so use a hammer. He deals insane damage with his melees, but he has next to no poise and can get staggered out of pretty much anything. So if you can
can master jump attack timing and guard counters using the curved sword and claw talismans, this fight should honestly be nothing. The watchdogs are giant stone statues, so them being immune to every status ailment should be obvious. Most of its attacks have pretty obvious telegraphs, but its fire breathing attack has a huge recovery time, allowing you to get in more than a couple strikes before it attacks again. The worm face is extremely dangerous at long range. It can spam death vomit at you at twice the range and speed of its normal enemy counterparts. Law of Regression can counter the death effects while you get close and deal damage to its legs, but if you don't have that option, you can also just hide behind a tree or a pillar or something when he attacks. What, are you waiting for an end card or something? I'm done. Get the fuck out of here. Bye.